Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I am Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to be here. Alif Shafak is an award-winning British-Turkish novelist. She writes in both Turkish and English, and has published 19 books, 12 of which are novels. Her work has been translated into 55 languages. Her latest novel, 10 Minutes, 38 Seconds in This Strange World, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and the Andachi Prize and chosen for Blackwell's Book of the Year. Her previous novel, The 40 Rules of Love, was chosen by BBC among 100 novels that shaped our world. She holds a PhD in political science and she has taught at various universities in Turkey, the United States and the UK, including St. Anne's College and Oxford University, where she is an honorary fellow. She is a fellow and a vice president of the Royal Society of Literature, a member of We Forum Global Agenda Council on Creative Economy, and a founding member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. In 2017, she was chosen by Politico as one of the 12 people who will give you a much needed lift of the heart. She has judged numerous literary prizes, most recently the Penn Nabokov Prize and chaired the Welcome Prize. She joins us this evening with her new novel, The Island of Missing Trees. Siri Hustvet, a novelist and scholar, has a PhD in English literature and is a lecturer in psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medical College. She is the author of a poetry collection, seven novels, four collections of essays, and several works of nonfiction. She has published papers in various academic and scientific journals and is the recipient of numerous awards, including the prestigious Princess of Astorius Award for Literature, an American Academy of the Arts and Letters Award in Literature, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Fiction for The Blazing World, which was also long listed for the Man Booker Prize. She joins us today with her new essay collection, Mothers, Fathers, and Others. Thank you both so much for being here. And now we'll welcome Alif to the screen first. Thanks, Alif. I, I'm, I'm so excited to share this, this platform with you, Siri. Uh, I, you know, Me I, too. <laughs> I, have so much, I have so much love and respect for your work, you know, your voice. Um, so really looking forward to this conversation. We agreed that we would be reading um, just very briefly from our books. So I thought I could read maybe from the very beginning of The Island of Missing Trees. And maybe I can tell just a few words about this book. Uh, this is a story that takes place in two islands, like actually, Cyprus and the UK. Um, it's, um, it's a love story. You might say it's a forbidden love. But it's also a book that focuses on war, partition, uh, division, ethnic violence. The truth is I've been wanting to write about Cyprus for a very long time. It's a beautiful island with beautiful people. But how do you tell the story of a place that has experienced such violence and such a division without yourself falling into the trap of nationalism or tribalism as a storyteller? I could not find that angle, that opening into the book until I found the voice of the fig tree. So it might sound strange, but I feel very grateful to this fig tree. So in that regard, this is also the story uh, of trees. And the book is dedicated to immigrants and exiles everywhere. They uprooted, they rerooted, the rootless, and to the trees we left behind, rooted in our memories. And this is how it starts. Once upon a memory, at the far end of the Mediterranean Sea, there lay an island so beautiful and blue that the many travelers, pilgrims, crusaders, and merchants who fell in love with it either wanted never to leave or tried to tow it with hemp ropes all the way back to their own countries. Legends, perhaps, but legends are there to tell us what history has forgotten it has been many years since I fled that place on board a plane, inside a suitcase made of soft black leather, never to return. I have since adopted another land, England, where I have grown and thrived, but not a single day passes that I do not yearn to be back, 
home, motherland. It must still be there where I left it, rising and sinking with the waves that break and foam upon its rugged coastline. At the crossroads of three continents, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Levant, that vast and impenetrable region vanished entirely from the maps of today. A map is a two-dimensional representation with arbitrary symbols and lines that decide who is to be our enemy and who is to be our friend, who deserves our love and who deserves our hatred and who our sheer indifference. Cartography is another name for stories told by winners, for stories told by those who have lost. There isn't one. So I'll stop here and I'd love to listen to your reading. Okay. Um, this is from a book called Mothers, Fathers and Others. And I am a huge fan of, of Elif's work as she knows and the Island of Missing Trees is a, is a beautiful uh, moving book. And um, even though it may not sound like it, we actually have many overlaps in our thinking. Um, there's quite a bit about maternity in this book. Um, uh, women that I've known, including my grandmother and mother, um, but it expands into questions of misogyny and um, into questions that I think Alif is fascinated by too. What is missing in tradition? What do we omit? And what does that tell us about ourselves? I'm going to do the same thing. Read um, from uh, the first essay in the book, which is about my grandmother. It's called Tilly. My paternal grandmother was ornery, fat, and formidable. She cackled when she laughed, brooded for reasons known only to her, barked out her sometimes alarming opinions, and spoke a Norwegian dialect impenetrable to me. Although she was born in the United States, she never mastered the TH sound in English and opted for a straight T instead. Referring to tings and thunderstorms and Thanksgiving. When I was a child, her hair was thick and white and when loose, it fell almost to her waist. Before I knew her, it had been auburn. It thinned over the years, but I remember my awe when I saw it down. That happened only at night after she had unpinned her bun in front of the hazy mirror in the tiny musty mildewed bedroom of the farmhouse where she lived with my grandfather who had his own even smaller room under the eaves just up the narrow wooden steps on a floor we were rarely allowed to visit. Once her hair had fallen and her nightgown was on, my grandmother took out her teeth and put them in a glass by the bed, an act that fascinated me and my sister leave because we had no body parts that could be removed at night and replaced in the morning. The extractable teeth, however, were only one piece of an altogether marvelous, if sometimes intimidating being. Our grandmother peeled potatoes with a paring knife at what seemed to me the speed of light, hauled logs from the wood pile near the house and yanked open the heavy door to the root cellar with a single gesture as strong as any man's before she led us down to the cold, dank domain where canned goods stood in their glass jars on shelves lined up against earthen walls. It was a place that smelled of the grave, a thought that may or may not have occurred to me then, but the excursion was always accompanied by a whiff of threat, by the fantasy that I would be left below with the jars and the snakes and the ghosts in blackness. She was the only grown up we knew who enjoyed telling poop jokes. She rocked with laughter over our plot plot funnies as if she were a child herself. And when she was in a good mood, she told us stories from the long lost days of her own childhood, how she had learned to turn handsprings and cartwheels and walk on a wire. 
and how she and her brothers hoisted sails on their sleds and were blown hard and fast across the frozen lake near the farm where she grew up. Before we went visiting, a word that signaled we were about to hop in the old Ford and call on various neighbors, Grandma put on her straw hat with the flowers on it that hung on a hook inside the front door and grabbed her black handbag with the gold clasp that had her little coin purse inside it and we were off. My grandmother died when she was 98. She has been a ghost in my life for some time, but she has been returning lately in a mental image. I see Matilda Underdal Hustvet coming toward me carrying two heavy pails of water. Behind her is the rusted hand pump that still stands on the property. And behind the pump are the stones, which were once the foundation of the old barn that had been torn down long before I was born. It is summer. I see my grandmother's cotton house dress buttoned up the front. I see her low breasts, wide body and thick legs. I see the loose flesh under her arms jiggle as she walks straight armed with the enameled metal buckets. And I see her fierce red rimmed sunken eyes behind her glasses. I feel the heat of the sun and the hot wind that blows across the undulating flats of rural Minnesota. I see an immense sky and the broad blank horizon interrupted by copses of trees. The memory image is accompanied by a mixture of satisfaction and pain. So <laughs> we've done the first pages <laughs> of our books. Of our books. But I so agree, you know, with what you said, even though it seems like these are very different books at first glance, I really think they're underground tunnels that connect them. Uh, and one of the things that fascinate both of us is, of course, intergenerational memories. You know, what is transmitted from one generation to the next and what is not. So not only family stories, but also family silences. That's I think, right. Yeah. And, and, and I wonder if you'd agree with this. But one thing that I've observed um, again and again on both sides of the Atlantic, actually, especially among immigrant families, is the elderly, the first generation, the ones who have experienced the biggest hardships, you know, they do carry these memories, but they don't necessarily have a language to talk about them, and they usually don't, so it's within. The second generation is not that interested in the past because they have to find their feet, <laughs> they have to be forward looking, you know, they're busy with life. So it's the third or the fourth generations, the youngest in these families, who are actually asking the sharpest questions or the strongest questions about identity, about memory, their ancestors' journeys. So it intrigues me to see young people carrying the memories of the old, you know? Uh, yes, old. and but and I, I think also assuming uh, what you said too, that the interest is greater later in those later generations, um, but there is a way that certain scars, omissions, traumas um, are nevertheless transferred across generations. And not until they're articulated in some way mm -hmm. uh, are they able to maybe not be diffused, certainly not, you know, there's no magic, yeah. but um, distance and articulation, uh, I think are really meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, this really resonates with me. I think those absences, those silences, they shape us. Um, and one of the, questions that I wanted to explore in this book in particular was inherited pain. Yeah. It's difficult to talk about it. We always talk about, you know, how we inherited the color of our hair, the shape of our chin from our parents or grandparents. But do we also inherit their sorrows or something as subtle, as abstract as maybe pain or, or melancholy? I'm, I'm very intrigued by, by that. I, and, I, and I also hear what you said um, in another sense as well, because I think memory matters, not in order to get stuck in the past, but also for healing memory matters, because there's no way we can repair 
what we don't remember. I, I, I agree completely. I also think that, you know, human beings, because we have reflective self-consciousness, we're able to think about ourselves as others when we need to, right? Um, that that allows um, a re-understanding of the past as time goes on. In other words, the past changes too, right? It changes with the present. And that this reading actually of my grandmother is a kind of reconfiguration of her through my later adult self. You know, that woman that I'm talking about in here, the one who put her long white hair down was probably my age. She was in her 60s when I was a little girl. Um, so I'm returning to that you know, maternal figure, but reimagining it from my current position and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So reimagining the past and framing it also makes a difference. And that takes some imagination. Definitely, definitely. I love your book, and, and, and actually the first essay is um, very, very emotional for me as well, because maybe because I was raised by a grandmother myself, I was very close to my maternal grandmother, and I saw lots of connections there. But I wonder if, you, if you'd agree with this. Often, especially in countries such as Turkey, you know, it's my motherland, where written culture erases so much knowledge you know mm. it does tell a story but it also era erases so many other stories so when i look at oral storytelling i what i see is women are the keepers of memory you know and they are the ones who somehow ferry that knowledge from one generation to the next not not always via knowledge maybe sometimes via legends or myths or even superstitions some other format, but me, women are the keepers of memory, it seems to me. Absolutely. And, and they are outside what we think of as traditional narrative histories, right? Um, my grandmother was a great storyteller and uh, she had a second grade education. I mean, she literally went to school for two years before she left. She was a farm girl. My grandfather uh, who read more than my grandmother only went to school for four years. He left in, after the fourth grade. Um, so these were rural people with very little education, uh, but especially my grandmother had a great gift for, for telling stories. And, um, and, you know, I remember these wonderful tales from her childhood still, as I mentioned uh, there. But what, so what, what is important about this? What's important is that the sort of great white man narrative of history, to be blunt about it, <laughs> yeah. is, is, is what we've all been brought up on. And even in my own family, as I argue in this essay, my father told time by the fathers. Mm -hmm. He wrote about his family. He was a third generation immigrant. Mm -hmm dedicated his life to Norwegian American studies. Mm -hmm. um, but the, what he was really interested in was the paternal line. So the, you know, the maternal is left out. It's a huge omission in much of um, what we think of as written, as you say, written history. Absolutely. And, and most of that history, as you said, is actually his story. And that him is uh, almost always, you know, white man of a certain class background of a certain yeah. age. But also I think the, the history that we internalize, that we swallow, at least again, I think of the education that I've had in Turkey, doesn't have hum individual human beings in it. It's, it's more abstract. And the very few individuals that are mentioned, if ever, are always sultans and sheikhul islams, you know, men <laughs> in power. So what doesn't occur to us is this very simple but fundamental question. For instance, how would I see the Ottoman Empire had I been, you know, a concubine in the harem? Had I been a Jewish miller or an Armenian silversmith or a Kurdish peasant, you know, or an Arab farmer? the moment you switch that lens, the story changes. But that exercise 
which I think is good for the mind, but also good for the soul. It doesn't occur to us because, his, because history is thought, taught to us in only one way, one format. Maybe at the end of the day, every nation state has its own official version of things. But I think it makes a big difference whether it's a democracy or not, you know, the country we're talking about. Because in a, in a democracy, you can walk into a bookstore and you can find so many books that question the official narrative. Yes, yes. Whereas in a non-democracy, that single narrative is imposed from above. So it becomes very difficult to talk about, you know, so-called ordinary human beings. Nobody is ordinary, but just human elements in, in history is completely lost. And so the yes. voices of minorities, the voices of women, you need to dig them out constantly and bring the periphery to the center. And, you know, these arguments cross disciplines. It's really fascinating. It's the same in uh, medicine. I've been to a lot of psychiatric conferences and, and given lectures. And one of the things I always say is, you know, thank you so much for this really interesting paper. But, you know, what's missing here is the patient's voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's like, there's no quoting of the patients. And usually people look at, you know, they look at you startled. And I said, but actually, this is what we need to begin to incorporate mm -hmm. into medical writing of all kinds is to at least let the patients say something. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's a kind of suppression, but you're right. I mean, the ideal in a democracy is pluralism. And of course, there are remarkable movements in, in, in history um, telling even individual stories mm -hmm. um, uh, that open up questions in historiography that are really interesting. Um, but the less democracy, the stronger the mythos. Yeah, and that of course, yeah. that of course is hand happening in in the United States as well. That um, there's a fight to retain a fantasy narrative of this country, and um, we really don't know how this is going to turn out. Yeah, I hear, I hear every word. Yeah, and it worries me too. I mean, especially the damage done to institutions democratic institutions, democratic norms, but also language. Here in the UK as well, I mean, you know, I, I've been here for the last maybe 13 years now. And when I first moved here, I, I used to think British people are very calm when they talk about politics. That calmness, <laughs> that calmness is gone, you know, it has evaporated. And suddenly politics became replete with martial metaphors. Yeah. Which, which worries me. So, um, I think one thing we learned from, again, countries like Turkey is the ballot box in itself is not enough to sustain no. a democracy. No. You have to have a separation of powers. No, nobody, no party, no tech company should have absolute power, in my opinion. No. Checks and balances, diverse media, women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights, with all these components, plus a ballot box, a democracy survives. Otherwise, it's just majoritarianism. And from majoritarianism into authoritarianism, it's a very quick fall. Yes, absolutely. So <clears throat> really the, you know, my uh, utopian fantasy about all this is uh, epistemological pluralism, right? That we, ha there are many ways to look at the same problem. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you take various disciplines, uh, history, uh, literature, what, uh, uh, biology, what what have you, and you address the same problem, you're going to come up with a different answer. But if you have enough of those points of view, those perspectives, you know, how do we know what we know? Well, we can know things in many different ways. You'll get what I call a focused zone of ambiguity, and that will allow you to ask the next best question. But it's very dangerous when people believe they own the truth. Yeah. Yeah. It's, All right. yeah. So, and then, so, yeah. <laughs> and then we're divided into these epistemological tribes. Um, one of the many things I love about your work is how interdisciplinary, you know, your, that, that knowledge, that field of knowledge is. And it's, it's rare 
especially among fiction writers. I think we need to be intellectual nomads. I, I see an intellectual nomad in, in your work and it fascinates me, you know, the, the, the range of disciplines that you travel through. Well, I'm old now, Elise. <laughs> So I've been going here for a long time. But yes, I think that interdisciplinarity in general gives people a flexibility of mind that you can't have if you just stick in one in one discipline or have only one way of looking at the world. Um, but actually, in your book, I was fascinated um, by the well, by the biology. And how that biology, which is also mythical, it's a kind of, you know, you, 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 you glom together actual biological realities that are becoming more and more interesting, I think, um, about uh, communication uh, among plants. I think many people have begun to read about this. It's come out in media, um, but also using a very old, um myth about Daphne yes <laughs> how did you get the idea to mush those together <laughs> you, you, you know you and I we both share this love for trees we, we're both tree huggers in, in <laughs> um, and I agree with you I think we have so much to learn from trees I mean even though there has been a remarkable literature especially in the last two decades about trees yeah. that yeah. so much we don't know about them uh, they're far more sentient than we recognize if i may quickly share this you know when i lived in michigan and arbor i used to be a visiting scholar there and the winters were very cold i remember some italian american families burying their fig trees if the winters ah. were particularly harsh ah. this mechanical technique you know you gently push these trees under the ground you dig a basically a trench and then you cover them, this vertical tree becomes horizontal and come next spring, you unbury them. This was important for me because when you talk about Cyprus, as you know, there's a, a bi-communal organization there. It's called the Committee on Missing Persons. The United Nations launched it, but it's the Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots together doing the work. And many of them are women. Many of them are young people. And basically they're digging the ground to find the bones of people who went missing during the troubles. Uh, which, of course, is, a, is an important theme also in many places in South America, in Guatemala, yeah. Chile, Spain after the civil war, the, after the Yazidi genocide, or in Bosnia after the genocide. We, we saw people digging the ground so that they can give the dead dignity, you know, a yeah. grave, yeah. but also the families a possibility for healing, a sense of closure. So that sense, that metaphor of burial and unburial, Coming back to your, you know, question from trees into human beings. If you follow the root of trees, I, I actually you can start talking about things that you might find talking about, you know, dif difficult to talk about otherwise. Yeah, and I, I also think that um, what is very strange about the world now is how very small it's become how profoundly threatened all human beings are on the face of the earth. This clearly differs by class, by place. You know, there are rich countries and poor countries, but nevertheless, the threat is global. And rather than admit to our mutual an absolute dependency on one another. Yeah. You see the rise of anti-democratic movements, nativist movements, forms of nationalism. And this is, of course, the politics of fear. But in a way, the politics of fear should move in the opposite direction because we, we won't solve ecological catastrophe or you know, political tribalism in, in these ways, right? And it seems clear to some people and obviously not at all clear to others. Yeah, indeed. And so, as you say, at a time when we need internationalism the most, 
uh, in the face of climate catastrophe, in the face of the possibility of another pandemic, everything shows that we are interconnected. But at a moment like this, when we need global sisterhood, global solidarity, what we ended up with is vaccine nationalism. Yeah. Is rise of populist nativist movements in country after country. And I think one thing that also gets lost in this extreme you know, atmosphere of tension, there's a lot of tension right now, is, is knowledge. Populism is essentially anti-intellectual. Yes. It's anti-knowledge. You know, we always talk about how it's, it erodes democracy, the institutions, but I think it also is very much anti uh, the accumulation of knowledge itself. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I mean, I often think about this because it is not, by the way, I think everyone should understand that this kind of anti-intellectualism is not um, limited to the right. It, it spreads across <laughs> uh, the political spectrum in many ways. And um, there's a kind of knee-jerk rebellion against deep thought and asking philosophical questions that we really need to ask um, about you know, human beings, what is our role on earth? You know, chances are that you know, we could disappear as a species, but the earth will continue. Um, but we want, I do anyway, <laughs> I want us to continue as a species. And I think that um, in order to do that, we have to think about deep questions. I mean, some of them I ask in this book about gestation, birth and human development. This is strangely missing from the Western tradition, even from large swaths of, of science, you know, that treats the subject, the scientific subject as a grown man. Mm -hmm. um, we're in motion and uh, our biology is a process, right? We're not things so much as processes. And uh, it's hard to break through the very powerful platitudes of a given culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you can really stand up there and, and howl. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it doesn't get received. And I, I think this is something we have to work on. Definitely. Also, I think we need to make a distinction between information, knowledge, yes. and yes. perhaps wisdom, you know, they're completely yes. different things. Yeah. And for a very long time, we have romanticized information. <laughs> we both remember how late 1990s, early 2000s, there was so much emphasis on this, like this was the age of information, thanks to social media, digital technologies, information was gonna spread everywhere. And if you give people, yes enough information they're going to become informed citizens and they're going to make the right choices so it was the triumph of liberal democracy you know nothing can go That's wrong right. in this, no, no. And this is all right but it's also the way this is framed right as you you see this in, in media all the time the alarm about the post-truth world well i'm alarmed about that too but the remediation that's suggested is the fact you have to get the facts right a fact is a very puny thing without interpretation, yeah. right? People can marshal all sorts of facts to make very different arguments. And um, that idea that the fact will save us is very close to that information will save us. That is not how it works. And what is wrong with this? Part of what is wrong with this goes way back in science to the 17th century to ideas of mechanism that nature is a mechanism and that feeling mm -hmm. sentience as you men mentioned earlier emotion yeah. can just be lopped out of the equation but this is not true right politics is mostly driven by emotions good and bad we can say we can argue about that 
but uh, human beings are, are not ambulatory uh, uh, machines. We're not mechanisms. No. And the models in science have often failed to incorporate that aspect of human beings. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable that we, we belittle emotions and feelings. You know, um, as I say in my book, it's because they're associated with women. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that, as you as you point out, because it's associated with women. You know, women are thought to be emotional creatures, which is nonsense. Women and men across genders, we we're not only emotional creatures, but I think what we remember, we remember via emotions and feelings. So yeah. memory, memory is also very much, you know, you, you write about this. To me, it's just heartbreaking to see that many populist demagogues understand this transformative yes. power of emotions far better than their liberal counterparts. And I yes. find that quite worrying. And, you know, uh, during the Nazi period, Goebbels did too. This was exactly um, how he... Uh, ran propaganda, mm -hmm. keep mm -hmm. it simple, keep it emotional, have an enemy, repeat that enemy over and over. Um, it's clever. And we've, we've seen it in the United States as well. It's still going on, but we had it from the bully pu pulpit of the presidency, you know, for years. And it has powerful effects. And unless we integrate an idea of emotion as a powerful factor in human life, uh, we will not be able to understand what's happening to us. You know, I want to follow up on that. One of the things that preoccupies me is how do you think literature will be shaped in, in this moment? Uh, Doris Lessing, you know, when she writes in this uh, essay beautifully, she calls literature analysis after the event. Things mm -hmm. happen and then you need some time to pass. We need to absorb, process. So in retrospect, we write. I understand that, but it seems to me like more and more literature also is becoming analysis during the event, not only after. So I wonder I, how you see. I, I agree. I mean, I think there is the, uh, you know, the, the consciousness an urgency of the now <laughs> mm, yeah. and that not all writers, but many writers, myself included, uh, feel a compulsion to respond mm -hmm. uh, to, to what's happening because I think we are in an emergency mm -hmm. and that emergency is multiple. It's not just you know, viral illness spreading around the earth. It's many other factors, um, including, as you said earlier, which I really wanted to seize upon, language, mm -hmm. how language is used, uh, what words uh, come to mean, what repetition does, what slogans are, mm -hmm. um, and how important it is to maintain subtlety and um, beauty yeah. of language, yeah. music, the music of, of language, mm -hmm. and that there should be people who can read that, right? That's the danger is that we lose, you know, if everything is turned into a slogan, people lose the ability to read other things. Yeah. to read counter narratives right yeah that's why i think you know artists also struggle to defend multiplicity pluralism, yes yes which i think is also important in in questions about identity how we define ourselves because we're always reduced to a single thread you know, just one block monolithic you know title label whatever but but can can we not talk about identity in a much more fluid way? You know, rather than talking about single threads of identity, maybe can we talk about multiple belongings? So it seems to me like I, I always associate freedom with multiplicity, pluralism, both inner pluralism, 
but also recognizing that pluralism is so important for literature. When you tell a story, those shifting perspectives, the ambiguity, the nuances, just refusing to, to reduce everything to binary oppositions. Yes. That's very difficult in today's world. Yes, I, and, and in some way there, I, I may be wrong, but there are times when I feel that it is getting harder <laughs> that that you know there and and it might partly be speed you know things are so speedy uh that uh you know that contemplation takes time mm -hmm. you know a book takes time to read mm -hmm. a painting takes time to look at and uh and you can't peg a complex work of art of any kind um, quickly, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a one-liner, it's not a joke. I love jokes, but that's that's not what we're talking about here. And, um, but you know, okay, I'm gonna make neoliberalism, right? Is a way of creating, making everybody into a consumer, right? Yeah everybody into an isolated monad who buys things. <laughs> and that undermines identities of all kinds, except consumer identity, right? Brand, you're associated with a brand or you become your own brand. I'm rather fascinated by this strange idea. Um, but that undermines collective reality, community, mm -hmm. right? Sharing, mm -hmm. uh, sharing books, knowledge, uh, whatever, because the narcissism um, that's trumpeted over and over again uh, makes people really lonely. Yeah, definitely. That's why I think we are at a major crossroads, actually. Um, yeah. and when the pandemic pushes us in that direction, we have some serious rethinking to do, both as individuals, but also societies, communities. Yeah. What do we want? Do we want more profit, more consumerism, you know, more rush, this endless speed, constantly feeling left behind in that sense, never keeping up? Or is it actually those things that we see as immaterial that we really understood are, are more valuable? Like yeah. sisterhood, like family, like love, like the luxury of sitting under a tree, reading, reading a book. But basically, I think my, my point is, it's a time when we need to reconnect. We yeah. talked about emotions. There's one emotion that really scares me, and that's the lack of all emotions. I yeah. think it's numbness. You know, the moment we become numb, indifferent, desensitized, the moment we stop caring. If I stop caring about what's happening in America, if you stop caring about what's happening in Turkey, you know, the moment we're atomized like that, the moment we enter into the age of apathy, that scares me a lot. Yeah. No, no feeling is the most terrible state, I think. And, you know, there are forms of pathology. I mean, psychopathy, no empathy, no guilt. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that the culture um, sometimes champions that way of being. And we have to fight it with everything we have. Um, you know, the autonomous, you know, male hero who doesn't give a damn. I mean, <laughs> this is very American too, you know, the lone cowboy. I mean, it has sometimes been, um, you know, smothered with heroic nobility, saving women from, I don't know, the Indians, you know, these kind of awful uh, narratives. But that autonomy is a lie. Also, that strength is a lie. You know, we associate and the strength, strength is a lie. Yeah, and we project that also to these populist demagogues because we call them strong men. Yeah. But oftentimes they're so insecure. Because they're so insecure, you know, they, 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 That's they continue it. with that kind of authoritarianism. So we, why do we associate it with strength is, is another puzzle. Yeah. yeah. Precarious masculinity, right? So precarious masculinity is there's this 
fantasy that a woman is just a woman. She's just there. She just is. But men have to prove their masculinity over and over again. Which, you know, which, which eating also, steak, not arugula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is also, I think, a straight jacket for many men, especially yeah. many young men who don't, if they don't conform to given definition of masculinity, life is hard. You, know, yes. you can be shunned, you can be ridiculed, even ostracized especially in, in places where patriarchy is very acute. I think patriarchy yeah. is universal, but in, where, it's, where it's sharper. So it's, it's important to, to, to discuss masculinity. It will also be good for men. Yeah. Uh, and it really does yeah. a zero-sum game. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think we need feminism everywhere. Yep, we do. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. Shall we take a... Um, yeah. Look the questions. At I think questions. We, are there questions? There are many, actually. Oh, there are. Hello, sure. welcome. Okay. okay, I am back. I'm going to be doing the job of Q and A moderator. Um, the first question: How do you each retain complexity for other people and for yourself when the others are denying you of yours? For example, the intense anger and resentment in the abortion law of Texas. This is, this is a very good question. <laughs> How do you maintain complexity in the face of, um, yeah, in, in the face of something like that? I, I agree. I think um, I, wrote an, I wrote an essay about hate speech. And one of the things I said in it was that hate speech does not tolerate dialogue. It is a way of annihilating the other. Um, uh, the Texas law, of course, is a way of saying women can't decide, we're deciding. And I, for one, do not want to, you know, give up lie down in the ground and, and just cry. <laughs> I don't know what Elise thinks, but I think you have to keep talking. And actually I am interested in how the far right has um, co-opted biology in order to make their arguments because, you know, as I said earlier, gestation, a woman's body in multiple ways is essential to gestation particularly in the first trimester, but all along, all the way up until the eighth and ninth months. So um, once one understands the biology, um, for me, it helps answer our questions about abortion. This is not part of the public dialogue at all. It is totally missing. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just to follow up on that, we, we've been talking about how countries can go backwards. History doesn't necessarily move forward in a, in a linear, progressive way. That's no. in our imagination. No. You know, yeah. We want to believe that the arc of history bends towards justice. We want to believe that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday, but there's no such thing. And countries can go backwards. They can tumble into ultranationalism, authoritarianism, religious fundamentalism. And whenever or wherever that happens, we will see an increase in sexism, homophobia, misogyny. I think this is why women need to be, you know, more passionate defenders of pluralistic democracy because the yeah. first things that will be taken away will be women's rights and minority rights. And we're seeing that in Texas with this extreme abortion ban, uh, which also tells people you need to, you know, keep an eye on each other Yes, it's horrible, you know, to, from Uber drivers to people working in clinics, you know, that kind of fear. Yeah, uh, it's vigilante. Very sinister, yeah. very sinister about it. Yeah. But I agree with you. You know, we need to keep talking. We need to keep fighting. Uh, this, this is a, this is a long, long, long road, long struggle. But all, also, let's keep in mind places like Ireland, which always gives yeah. me hope. Not that long ago, you know, in Ireland abortion or same-sex marriage, it was really unthinkable. And what really made a big difference was when people started sharing stories, 
Yes. It, it, it changes if you know that your cousin is gay or your friend's best friend is, you know, had an abortion. It changes yeah. when you start sharing human stories. I think I those are the things that emotionally move us. So we have yeah. to keep speaking and our voices need to be heard in the public space. Absolutely. Okay, one more from the audience. How did you each become comfortable in your own em emotional intelligence to be assertive as a woman among other identities and ways of being? I ask this as a young budding woman in college. As the old lady, I say it took a long time. <laughs> I I don't know. I think I I you know I I went through I went through a lot to um to feel okay. I think I struggled as a young woman to feel comfortable with my own authority, even when I had that authority. Uh, and over time, I have come to understand uh, how deeply the culture resists women who claim authority because it is bucking the hierarchy. Uh, and I feel now at, at 66 uh, comfortable uh, with the punishment that some sometimes meted out against women who uh, who simply say, yes, I really do know this and I can talk about it <laughs> and uh, listen. Elif, you yeah. get here? <laughs> not, not so young. <laughs> No, I think it's um, it's it's an it's a journey. Definitely, we learn, and we learn. I learn from my my mistakes so much. But what I'm trying to say is, it's not something you gain and then once you're done, you're done. You know, you're no. there. <laughs> it's still a struggle. At yeah. maybe at yeah. this age, definitely for me, it's still a struggle. But it gets easier as we get older. You know, one thing that I've observed a lot especially in Turkey, but also across the Middle East and beyond, if you go and speak to younger kids, like seven-year-old, eight-year-old, there is no difference, almost no difference. You know, speak to Turkish kids, French kids, Canadian kids. They have so much chutzpah. They have so much creativity, confidence. And if you ask, is there anyone here who would like to become a novelist or a poet? So many hands go up. And at that age, girls are just as confident, if not even more confident than yes. boys. Yes. But then if you go and speak with high school, middle school, high school students, you know, they've gone through puberty and the change is so yes. radical. Everything is different now. Almost yeah. no one wants to become a novelist. Almost no one wants to become a poet. This I've observed this again and again, and girls have become timid. Yes. You know, especially in my motherland. Why? Because we taught them to always blend in don't stand out, you will be judged, how you carry your body, the length of your skirt, whether you speak too much, too loud, if you laugh, you know, loudly, all of that. So little by little, we kill that confidence. So I think rather than looking for confidence outside, we just remember that we already have it, but we, we lost it along the way. So to go back to that inner core, that inner garden, I think it's very important. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think to understand <clears throat> that we are all written by the culture in many ways. I mean, for me, coming to understand that I don't just write, but I've also been written by all these ideas that are part of my growing up shaping me who I am. And being conscious of that is really helpful. Mm -hmm. because then you can rewrite yeah and um you know you become a revision <laughs> you know the most recently edited version <laughs> of oneself thank you so much <clears throat> excuse me we have time for just one more question from our audience does deep thought 
deep thought is in quotes, does deep thought take too long in this age of sped up technology and social media? It probably might take too much time if you're on social media all the time, but if you go off it, then the time is there, naked time. Uh, everyone has some naked time. You know, the, 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 the questions are great. The, the questions are, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I love them. Um, I think it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? You will remember, Siri, there were so many predictions about how the novel as a genre was going to disappear. Because yeah. now that we were in the age of information, uh, nobody would have time to read novels and you know everything was based on speed but actually all those predictions failed mm -hmm. and, and novels are alive and i think this the faster the life we're living perhaps the deeper our need for something else something which is more nuanced which requires us to slow down because you can't rush knowledge you can rush information snippets of information but knowledge itself can't be rushed no. So we are very much aware that we need something different, something much more existential, um, and those connections. So I don't think this is going to disappear anytime soon, but we need to spend less time with information and, and put more emphasis on knowledge and ultimately, hopefully, aim for wisdom, which does require us to bring the mind and the heart together. And for that, we need empathy. We need emotional yeah. intelligence, but we also need to hear each other's voices beyond borders. Yeah. So I think there's something empowering about cultural festivals, you know, this kind of discussions that we are having now. And I honestly think these are amongst our last remaining democratic spaces. Yes, yes. And we have to protect them. We have to protect them. Yeah. yeah. What a perfect note to end on. Thank you both so much for joining us and for bringing these books to the Free Library of Philadelphia again. Um, thank you all to our audience for being here and for your support and have a great night. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs>